series. We've been preaching for some weeks now, minus the last two on the book of Daniel. We're into the eighth chapter this, uh, this particular Sunday. I hope to be able to put these videos all onto two or three DVDs when we're complete and make those available. They are available on YouTube and on the church website and uh, we, we put them on Facebook every week and so I would encourage you to share these messages with other folks that they may see and understand God's divine revelation for our, for our world. And uh, excellent, excellent series here that God has given us. God's divine revelation of the ram and the goat we're going to be looking at today. And as we move into the second revelation that God has given to Daniel, we're going to see some similarities to his prior revelation of the four beasts. These will help to substantiate the information that's already provided and to serve as a foundation for the growth of further more in-depth information that will be provided today. So actually what is happening here, God is utilizing a second vision that he's given to Daniel that builds upon the foundation previously established in chapter 7 in the vision of the four beasts. Please keep in mind that as we're making our way through the study, it's very important that you understand this, that Daniel, as well as all the Old Testament prophets, had no knowledge or understanding of the church age, the age we're living in today, the age that was initiated uh, on the day of Pentecost and has continued. They had a basic understanding of the coming of the Messiah, they had some understanding that he would establish his kingdom and that his people, the Jews, would someday reign. However, they lacked the information necessary to fully comprehend the mission of Jesus Christ. Isaiah certainly prophesied of the suffering Messiah, but comprehending the initiation of this church age, whereby the doors of heaven would be open to the Gentiles, was not possible based upon the information that God had given them at that time. They lacked knowledge of an interlude between the Messiah's first coming and his second coming. So as we are attempting to understand what Daniel is seeing in his visions, I want you to keep in mind that oftentimes the events are jammed together as though they should be happening in rapid succession while there may be unseen pockets of time in between the various happenings. We'll see as Daniel is talking about this that he is going to go from a man who existed in 170 B.C., all of a sudden, he's going to be relating the similarities of that individual to a time that has not yet come when the Antichrist will rule upon this earth. And Daniel puts it all together as though it's a bam, bam, bam succession of things. And yet we have had this wide open, uh, you know, 2,500 years almost to this date of, of where, of, of various happenings that have been going on. Now, let's see what the word begins to tell us here as we look at Daniel chapter 8, going into verse 1 and 2. In the third year of King Belshazzar's reign, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, after the one that had, had appeared to me earlier. I saw the vision, and as I watched, I was in the fortress city of Susa in the province of Elam. I saw in the vision that I was beside the Ulei Canal. So as Daniel begins here, we learn this revelation was received two years after the revelation of chapter 7. Belshazzar is still reigning as king of Babylon, and to the best of our knowledge, Daniel is still living in Babylon. As this vision begins to unfold, Daniel finds himself transported to Susa from Babylon, which was, and you can see there on the, on the map I have given you, which was the capital city of Persia, which is modern-day Iran. 
There in Susa, Daniel finds himself beside the Ulei Canal, which is a canal that was developed centuries ago that connected two major rivers flowing through that area. Now it's vital to understand that while this vision expands upon the understanding of what was previously given in chapter 7, its emphasis is going to be much different. Chapter 7 focused upon four great world empires, whereas the significant focus of chapter 8 is upon God's covenant people, the Jews. As we move through this chapter, Daniel is going to introduce to us uh, a character similar in nature to the end times Antichrist who actually existed 170 years before Jesus Christ came to this earth. Antiochus Epiphanes was his name. He was very similar in nature to the Hitler that we know from the 1930s and 40s. He ravaged, he persecuted, and he sought to destroy God's people, the Jews. Then suddenly, all of a sudden, we will be transported forward in time to a time that has not yet come when a very similar character, the Antichrist, will come on scene and carry out an even more sinister plan. Something I want you to notice in all of this is that Satan and his plan is behind all of these characters. Now keep in mind, I told you this a number of weeks ago, that the plan of all of this is God's plan. Satan did not initiate any of this planning, if you will, about the events that were yet to come. It's all a part of God's plan. However, he utilizes Satan. And Satan's plan, Satan's attitude, Satan's character, Satan's nature to wreak havoc upon God's chosen people. And recognize that Satan's plan is to thwart, to offset, to hinder the plan of God for his people. Why? Because Satan understands that his judgment is coming. Satan understands that there is an end time coming. He is very well aware of the end of the book. And so since the very time that Christ was born upon this earth, Satan has been trying everything in his power to change God's plan around in order to hinder or to stop God from one day judging him. If you were to Google the word anti-Semitism, which basically means anti-Jew, you will find an abundance of information pertaining to the numerous times in history when nations have tried their very best to stamp out the Jewish nation. Yet, they continue to thrive because God has a plan for them. With that in mind, let's begin to look at this vision. Daniel begins by sharing what he sees in the vision that we will refer to as the vision of the ram and the goat. He says, I looked up and there was a ram standing beside the canal. He had two horns. The two horns were long, but one was longer than the other, and the longer one came up last. I saw the ram charging to the west, to the north, to the south. No animal could stand against him, and there was no rescue from his power. He did whatever he wanted, and he became great. As I was observing, a male goat appeared, coming from the west across the surface of the entire earth without touching the ground. The goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. He came toward the two-horned ram I had seen standing beside the canal, and he rushed at him with savage fury. I saw him approaching the ram, and infuriated with him, he struck the ram, shattering its two horns, and the ram was not strong enough to stand against him. The goat threw him to the ground, and he trampled him, and there was no one to rescue the ram from his power. Then the male goat became very great, but when he became powerful, the large horn was shattered, 
and four conspicuous horns came up in its place, pointing toward the four winds of the heavens. Now let's look at this very quickly for just a moment. Daniel envisions a ram, a, a somewhat unusual ram he talks about. It had two long horns. One of them was longer than the other, and it grew slower than the other. It ran about in a charging manner in all directions and was superior to and over anything that got in its way. It did whatever it wanted to whenever it desired to. During his observation of this ram, all of a sudden a male goat appears coming from the west, and as it moved, it, it appeared its feet were not even touching the ground. It had a single conspicuous noticeable horn between its eyes. It rushed at the ram, it struck the ram, it shattered its horns, and it trampled it into, uh, into the ground. And then it says, this male goat became great. Then at the pinnacle of its greatness, its large horn was shattered and four smaller horns appeared in its place that were pointing in all directions of the compass. Now what I want us to do, because uh, this, this uh, part of the vision is, is explained very well, is skip down to verse 20 through 22, and we're going to see the, an understanding here. He goes on beginning in verse 20, and he says, The two-horned ram that you saw represents the kings of Media and Persia. Now you'll remember, if you will, we're still here under the authority of Belshazzar. The Medians and the Persians had not yet come in following the writing on the wall and destroyed Babylon and taken over. So he says, the two-horned ram that you saw represents the kings of Media and Persia. The shaggy goat represents the king of Greece, which was Alexander the Great. And the large horn is its king, which is, or, or the shaggy goat represents the king of Greece, and the large represents its first king, that being uh, Alexander the Great. The four horns that took the place of the shattered horn represent four kingdoms. They will arise from that nation, but will lack its power. The two-horned ram represents the Medo-Persian Empire that would soon swoop into Babylon and under Belshazzar they would take over, they would destroy Belshazzar, they would destroy Babylon and they would take over, thus creating a great and a vast empire. The goat represents the Greek Empire and under the Alexander the Great, and history has shown this to be true, uh, he represent, he's represented by the single large horn. The Greek Empire moved very rapidly across the known world, building a great and massive empire as it went. But Alexander was overcome by a high fever while in India, what is modern-day India, and he died unexpectedly at the age of 32. At his death, his empire was divided among his four generals, which creates the four horns that come up, who basically covered the entire empire, these various kingdoms. Now history, well, looking back from where we are today, we understand that every bit of this played out just as Daniel had seen in this vision and it was related to him. Now as we continue progressing through the vision, we find ourselves considering the rise of the little horn. Let's look at this for a moment. From one of them, a little horn emerged. Now remember I told you that he jumps all of a sudden from one to another. Listen very close, closely. From one of them, a little horn emerged and it grew extensively toward the south and the east and toward the beautiful land. The beautiful land is the land of Judah, God's chosen land, the promised land. It grew as high as the heavenly host, made some of the stars and some of the host fall to the earth, and it trampled them. It made itself great, even up to the prince of the host. It removed his daily sacrifice and overthrew the place of his sanctuary. Because of rebellion, a host together with the daily sacrifice will be given over. The horn will throw truth to the ground and will be successful in whatever he does. Then I heard a holy one speaking. 
And another holy one said to the speaker, How long will the events of this vision last? The daily sacrifice, the rebellion that makes desolate, and the giving over of the sanctuary and the host to be trampled. He said to me, For 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary will be restored. Out of one of the Grecian kingdoms, these four that came out, out of one of them, a secondary little horn representing a secondary kingdom would sprout up. It would start out very small, but it would begin to grow in power and greatness as the kingdom developed and spread. The policies of the leader of that kingdom, a man by the name, as I've already told you, the name of Antiochus Epiphanes, would be driven by his cunning and deceitful methods as he adjusted his sights on the Jews and their destruction. Under his harsh rulership, the Jews would find themselves struggling to survive. He began his onslaught by destroying anything and everything that the Jewish religion stood for. And we see that here in the scripture we've read. He set himself up in opposition to God's plan by abolishing the daily sacrifice, by abolishing the religious festivals, and by abolishing the observance of the Sabbath day. The pinnacle of his desecration came, though, when he slaughtered a pig upon the altar of sacrifice in the temple of Almighty God in the city of Jerusalem. You know that pig swine are a great offense to the Jewish people. Antiochus Epiphanes went in and he had a hog, a pig, slaughtered upon the, the altar of sacrifice to Almighty God, and then he demanded that the people worship the Greek god Zeus from that point on. And he put up an image in the Holy of Holies of the temple in Jerusalem of the god Zeus. Anyone who opposed Antiochus Epiphanes was ruthlessly persecuted, and many were killed, were martyred, who refused to forsake worship of the God of Israel. Now God permitted, as verse 12 tells us, God permitted him to be successful in everything he set out to do. Why? Because of the rebellion of the Jewish people. You know, it had only been about four centuries when Antiochus Epiphanes came on scene, it had only been about 400 years since they had been in Babylonian captivity. And here they are once again rebelling against Almighty God. And Antiochus Epiphanes comes in as God's man to bring them back into line, if you will, to... to, uh, to, to take them to that place in their life to discipline them in order to bring them back in line in preparation for the coming of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. The heavenly beings that were speaking to Daniel here conversed among themselves as to how long this is going to take place. The response was 2,300 days. Now get this, which equals seven years on the Jewish calendar. Do you begin to see the similarities that are building in this vision between Antiochus Epiphanes and the Antichrist during the tribulation period? Do you see these things just beginning to stack up and show such a tremendous, uh, tremendous view to us, a foreshadowing of what was yet to come? And now we're going to find out about that. As we continue moving forward in the text, we begin to recognize how Antiochus Epiphanes and his works and his deceit and his cunning ways and his desecration of the temple and the way he persecuted the Jews with the intent of annihilating them is a shadowing by God of the things that are yet to come. 
Picking up in verse 15 and following, this is what we find. While I, Daniel, was watching the vision, I was trying to understand it. There stood before me someone who appeared to be a man. I heard a human voice coming from the middle of the Ulei. Gabriel, explain the vision to this man. So he approached where I was standing. When he came near, I was terrified and I fell down, face down. Son of man, he said to me, understand that the re vision refers to the time of the end. While he was speaking to me, I fell into a deep sleep with my face to the ground. Then he touched me and made me stand up. And he said, I am here to tell you what will happen at the conclusion of the time of wrath. Because it refers to the appointed time of the end. Now, Daniel was very perplexed here. And you can understand, you know, all of this going on before him. The angel Gabriel is called up and he's tasked with helping Daniel to come to an understanding of what all this means. Put these pieces of this puzzle together. And it was here that Gabriel presented the fact that what was being presented by God in this revelation was referred to, and he tells us, the time of the end, the conclusion of the times of wrath, the appointed time of the end. So Gabriel makes it very clear to Daniel that what you are really seeing here, Daniel, is a very, very future event. Of course, Daniel, he knows the Messiah still has to come. He understands that, but he doesn't see. It's like looking at a range of mountains. As you're driving toward a range of mountains, you see the mountain peaks, but you don't see the valleys between until you get real close. Daniel and the prophets of old saw the mountain peaks through these prophecies but they didn't see the interludes in between them. They were not allowed, the, 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 they were not privy to seeing the interludes that existed. And right now, we are living in that interlude. We are living in the church age, folks. And these guys had no understanding of a church age. They had nothing to, to reveal to them that there would be a time when God was going to open the doors up to the Gentiles to have access to the kingdom of God. And so to Daniel, this is all just running together. Bam, bam, bam. Keep that in mind. Antiochus Epiphanes and his rule would be a foreshadowing of the treachery that was still to come as God's ultimate wrath would be poured out, will be poured out, during that time that is yet to come, the tribulation period. You know, the Jewish people have undergone tremendous persecution over the past several millennia. <laughs> they have undergone, they have suffered tremendously as various men have risen up with the intent of annihilating them, getting rid of them just like Hitler did. But always failed in completely doing it. Why? Because God has a plan for his people. And God's plan will be played out to completion. And that is why this one little bitty tiny piece of land over in the Middle East is so vital to world politics. If you look at it on a map in comparison to any other country in the world, you realize that it is a very tiny, tiny piece of land that they own right now, that the Jews occupy at this moment in time. And yet the whole world fights over the Jews and has tried time and time again to rid the world of them, but has failed every time. Now, returning to the text, the understanding is given concerning the Medo-Persian. We've already looked at that. And the Greek Empire. We've already looked at that. We understand that. So now as we continue to read, I want you to see how all of a sudden this transition is made from Antiochus into the Antichrist. It says, near the end of their kingdoms. Whose kingdoms? Well, if you were to go back to the previous, um, to the previous vision, you would understand the, the kingdoms of the end of times, if you will. 
You had the Babylonian Empire, you had the Medo-Persian, you had the Greek, and then you had the Roman Empire, which was never really completely stamped out. We are, in a, in a way, still continuing to live very much, very similar to the Roman Empire, their laws and these various things. The Roman Empire still, in various ways, continues to exist even to this day. It says, near the end of their kingdoms, when the rebels have reached the full measure of their sin, an insolent king, skilled in intrigue, will come to the throne. His power will be great, but it will not be his own. He will cause terrible destruction and succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy the powerful along with the holy people. He will cause deceit to prosper through his cunning and by his influence. And in his own mind, he will make himself great. In a time of peace, he will destroy many. He will even stand against the prince of princes, but he will be shattered and not by human hands. Interesting passage of scripture. Think about it as the time winds down. Worldwide rebellion is at a pinnacle today. Man's sinfulness has reached its greatest mark. A man we understand to be the Antichrist is going to come on the world stage as the man with all the answers. Now let me step back just a minute because this doesn't take place until the rapture of the church has taken place. Daniel didn't understand the church age. Daniel didn't understand. It had not been revealed to him about the rapture. So Daniel never talks about the rapture. He never talks about the church age because he knew nothing of these particular events. In fact, it wasn't until Paul came along that we began to get a picture of the rapture because Paul said, Behold, I show you a mystery. He was assigned by God to reveal the mystery of the rapture of the church. And so what is taking place here is before this man comes to power, he may be alive in the world today, we don't know, but before he comes to power, folks, the church is going to be out of here. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up to be with him. We will, be, we will escape the coming wrath of God, if you will, because Jesus took our wrath upon the cross. Amen. And so the rapture will take place, and then these things begin to take place that Daniel is seeing here. He comes to the, he ascends, if you will, to world power, and he seems to have all the answers. He seems to be able to tell the world what's happened to the church. Where did they all go? You know, some aliens took them or whatever kind of story he concocts. He is able to pacify the world and to answer the questions that are arising as to what's going on. We also know that he makes a peace pact with the nation of Israel for three and a half years at the beginning of this tribulation period. And it talks about the time of peace. Before he rises, it's right in the midst of this peace that he breaks that contract with Israel. And that's when, pardon, all hell begins to break loose on earth. Because that's what it is, folks. I'm telling you, you think, you think it's bad right now? I'm telling you, when hell ascends to this earth to take over during this last three and a half years, folks, we don't want to be around. You don't want to be here. You want to escape. You want to get away because the Bible talks about how horrendous this last three and a half years of this tribulation is going to be. We get into the book of Revelation and begin to look at the judgments being poured out. I'm telling you folks, it will scare you to death, but praise God we're not here. I would hope that it will scare us enough though to where we don't want others to be here and we will do what the church has been called to do and share the good news of Jesus Christ. He comes on stage, the Antichrist. His power 
will be great, but it says it won't be his own. Why? Because Satan takes residence in the body of the Antichrist at the end of the first three and a half years. He was led around, directed by Satan, but at the end of the first three and a half years, he becomes filled by Satan. Satan takes over his body. He will successfully carry out destruction everywhere his desi he desires, and he will set himself up to destroy the remainder of the Jewish people. That's where Matthew 24 and 25 come in. You begin to read that, and, and if you don't understand that Jesus was talking about during the tribulation period, following the rapture of the church, which had yet been to be revealed, Jesus was sharing these things there in Matthew, and he was talking about these things. The nation of Israel, at the end of that three and a half years, when, when uh, the, the Antichrist breaks his peace plan with them, that's when the Bible and, and the old song from the 70s, I wish we'd all been ready, that's what it really is talking about. The Jews at that point in time, it says, it says run to the mountains. Because Satan himself is going to do everything in his power to destroy them. He goes through, woe to the, to, the, to the pregnant and the nursing woman. Woe to this, woe to that. Well, because of how terrible that moment in time is going to be in those years that are yet to follow. But it says at the pinnacle of his power, he's going to be destroyed. But not by human hands. At the end of seven years, which is the equivalent of 2,300 days on the Jewish calendar. See how that fits together? Jesus Christ is coming back with his saints behind him. And out of his mouth will flow the word. The, the sword will flow, come out of his mouth. As the armies are, are gathered, the armies of the world are gathered in the valley of Megiddo ready to annihilate and to stamp on and to destroy the city of Jerusalem, Jesus Christ is going to return at that very moment in time and He is going to wipe out the forces of evil that are gathered there, the armies of this world that have gathered in that valley as the battle of Armageddon is very short-lived. Jesus comes back and He sets up His kingdom here upon this earth for a thousand years, the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, where He'll set His throne up in Jerusalem, in the, in the uh, temple there, and He will rule and He will reign for a thousand years. Let me tell you something. God has a plan that was set in motion even before the beginning of time, whereby His kingdom shall reign forever and ever. Man's kingdoms, folks, have come and gone over the ages. They rise, they fall. They rise, they fall. The wickedness, the sinfulness of man continues to grow in our day in intensity. All you have to do is watch the news for a few minutes and you begin to see how ruthless man has become, how wicked man has become. As that first video I showed today, the wickedness in our world today is horrible, folks. You'd say, well, I can't see how it can get any worse. But I'm here to tell you, folks, during the tribulation period, it's going to get a whole lot worse. <laughs> Pressing forward to that moment when God finally decides enough is enough. That's all we're waiting for, church. We're waiting for God to decide enough is enough. That moment, son, go get my children. Listen as I close. I want to read the final verses of chapter 8. Daniel says, The vision of the evenings and the mornings that has been told is true. Now you must seal up the vision because it refers to many days in the future. I, Daniel, was overcome and I lay sick for days. Then I got up and I went about the king's business. I was greatly disturbed by the vision and could not understand it. Gabriel tells Daniel, seal up this vision because it pertains to future events. I want you to keep in mind, and I've shared with, this with you a number of times through this study, 
the very last chapter of Daniel, Daniel chapter 4, this verse reads, Daniel, keep these words. And he's talking about the entire uh, letter of Daniel, the entire book of Daniel. He says, Daniel, keep these words secret and seal up the book until the time of the end. Many will roam about and knowledge will increase. Folks, we're living in an age that was being talked about right there. We're living in an age where we are gaining a clearer and clearer picture as well as an understanding of things as never before. It wasn't that long ago that people could read the book of Daniel, and I'm, I'm talking in my lifetime. I'm talking about in the last 40 to 50 years, people didn't have an understanding exactly of what Daniel was talking about. They had a, a brief kind of understanding, but really, our comprehension today far exceeds what it was 50 years ago. Why? Because of the massive changes in our society that have been, have been taking place. Technology, think how much it has advanced in the last 50 years. Think about the war machine around the world and its advancements in the last 50 years. Think about how we can begin to see these things written in Scripture and through the inspiration of the Spirit of God, we can understand what's being talked about. Why is that? Because we're getting close to the end of time. We're living in that time that the angel was talking about here to Daniel where knowledge will increase. Understanding will increase. The thought of our world creeping towards such an end should cause us to cry out to God, church. To cry out for God for His mercy and His grace upon our younger generation as they find themselves confronted ever more with the wickedness of this world we're living in. Notice what it says, Daniel went back to the king's business. And I believe that's a strong indication, church, of what we're supposed to be doing right now. We need to be taking care of the king's business right now. It's not about me, it's not about you, it's about the lost people in this world. The king's business is not about this building, but it's about the lost people out in the world around us that need to know Jesus Christ. Amen. There's a time of tribulation coming, folks. But preceding that is a time of rapture. Are you ready for the rapture? Are you ready to hear that trumpet sound? If you're not, you need to get ready. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to be ready. Because we don't know what tomorrow holds. But I can tell you who holds tomorrow. And when enough is enough, it's going to happen, folks. And I believe it's very soon. I believe many of us that are living here today will be here when that event takes place. Are you ready? Are you ready to meet the Master? Stand with me this morning.